Welcome to science class. Today we are going to discuss evolution through natural selection. As I discussed in the previous video, there were many ideas about where the various kinds of life we see on the planet came from, and how to organize those forms of life, and how they were related to each other. The idea that organisms change over time was not unique to Charles Darwin. It's the mechanism for why it happens, natural selection, that we remember him most for. Charles Darwin was born on the same day as Abraham Lincoln, February 12, 1809. When he was 22, Darwin traveled aboard a research vessel called the HMS Beagle, which circumnavigated the globe. While on this five-year-long journey, Darwin encountered plants and animals across the globe that he could never have imagined existed. This was the 1830s, and people living in Darwin's England knew very little about the flora and fauna of most other continents. Darwin was perplexed that everywhere he went, he encountered such wildly different animals in places that appear so similar. For example, one of these photographs is Africa, and the other is the grasslands of North America. If they are so similar, then why are the animals in each place so different? One of these is Africa, and the other is the outback of Australia. Today, feral camels roam wild and are thriving in Australia, after being brought over from Africa. But why did they not exist there to begin with? Almost everybody in the world in Darwin's time believed in special creation, but Darwin's observations did not make sense in light of creation. Man was spread all over the globe, but very few other species were. In fact, many places such as Madagascar, the Galapagos Islands, and Australia are famous because the animals that live there live nowhere else on Earth. But when species are brought to new land masses, they oftentimes thrive. How could they be created to thrive in areas where they don't naturally exist? Darwin was also puzzled by the same genre of animal being found all over the globe in different forms. The musk oxen, American bison, Cape buffalo, and Asian water buffalo are all species of bovine, but they live in such radically different environments. And while they are fundamentally very similar, they look very different. Why would four kinds of the same creature be created to live in different places? It would make so much more sense for entirely different types of animals to live in the tundra versus tropical Asia. But instead, this is what we find. Another deep mystery to Darwin and other naturalists was the newly revealed extent of the fossil record. Enormous animals, the likes of which were completely unknown to anybody, were now being scientifically studied. All of a sudden, we knew that there used to exist 10, 20, 30 meter long reptiles and sloths the size of elephants. This posed a few glaring problems. One was that if special creation were true, then where were the accounts of these creatures? Cave paintings from the very earliest eras of human history depict some now extinct creatures, yes, but they are always mammals. No account of any dinosaur was ever made. Nobody would ever have forgotten about these beasts, and they would have passed down stories about them, much more convincing stories than the obvious make-believe of dragons. The other problem with these creatures was the fact that they were extinct. The idea that creatures would be specially created only then to go extinct was deeply illogical and troubling for people who subscribed to creationism and those who opposed it. It was becoming more and more clear at the time, and we know this for a fact today, that for every species that exists today, as many as 10 to 100 other species from the past are extinct. And I'm not talking about the number of creatures. I mean the number of species. There were more species of dinosaurs than there currently are species of mammals. How could the majority of beings that were created be extinct? Inspired by these observations and countless other experiments and tests carried out by Darwin himself and others, he gradually came up with his theory of natural selection. Let's get started. In his book on the origin of species, Darwin went as far as to say that all life on the planet is descendant from a single primordial form, a very early and extremely simple organism, whose descendants eventually went on to become the plants, animals, fungi, protists, algae, etc. 
how did Darwin suppose that life changes form? Darwin never actually used the term evolution. He called it descent with modification. Rather than supposing creatures were driven towards some sort of goal, which was the idea of orthogenesis, Darwin supposed something much more elegant and simple. Here are the basic assumptions of the theory. 1. There exists in all organisms some level of variation. Every oak tree is different in some way. Every human is different in some way. 2. That variation is heritable. 3. Organisms expend the majority of their energy competing for resources. Darwin called this the struggle for existence. 4. Because of this struggle, most organisms die before they can ever reproduce, or they are outcompeted by rivals of the same species and never get the opportunity. 5. Eventually, slight variations lead to slow incremental changes, which help the organism survive in the struggle for existence. Because of this, they have a statistically higher chance of surviving longer and producing more offspring that inherit some of their positive characteristics, which slowly changes the entire population of the organisms. 6. These modifications are the essence of evolution, the modification of a species over time, and eventually these changes can lead to an entirely new type of organism. These explanations eliminated the requirement for special creation, and they were more simple and therefore more likely. These explanations also did away with the idea of hybridization and the Lamarckian idea of orthogenesis, which is evolution towards a goal. If organisms were evolving with a goal in mind, then they should never go extinct, because avoiding extinction would have to be the sole purpose for evolving. Extinctions and orthogenesis are not compatible. Darwin's idea was also a stark contrast to the hybridization theories. Those theories suggested that a species could not evolve into a new species by reproducing with members of their own species. They would have to mate with other species. But Darwin's theory proposes that over very long spans of time, yes, one species changes into another by reproducing with members of its own species. Evolution is hard to imagine, and we certainly don't see it happen right before our eyes, except in a few cases. Let's use an analogy to try and ground the idea. We will go back to dog breeding. Today, bulldogs exist. That's undeniable. We know that we bred bulldogs. They don't exist in the wild. This means that bulldogs have not always existed. Also undeniable. The weird thing is that every bulldog is the offspring of a parent that was virtually indistinguishable from itself. This means that there never was the first bulldog. If you observed the change from each generation to the next, the changes would have been so subtle that you'd never notice them. But if you went backwards a few hundred or a few thousand generations, you'd end up at a dog that isn't a bulldog. The same sort of thing happens with species. There never was a first dog in general, or human. The common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees gave birth to two different offspring. Over millions of years, each of those offspring's lineages gradually changed along their own path, eventually giving rise to two completely different species. Back to Darwin's original hypothesis. If his ideas were correct, they would have to be proven through experiment and or observation. Sometimes a scientific idea can't realistically be experimented with. We can't make black holes to prove Einstein's ideas about general relativity, but we can observe them and still confirm general relativity. If a scientific idea graduates to a scientific theory, that's the highest honor it can achieve. Theory is synonymous with fact in this context. People who attack evolution dimly label it as just a theory, while failing to recognize that it's also just the germ theory of disease, the theory of gravity, the theory of plate tectonics, or heliocentric theory. Scientific ideas only count if they are disprovable, and evolution has by no means been disproven. It's been confirmed time and time again. Let's look at some examples. We will begin with the idea of competition and the struggle for existence. This explains almost every single characteristic of every organism that we are capable of observing. Why do trees produce tens of thousands of seeds? 
because the odds of even one of them germinating are extremely low. Why do animals have such absurdly exaggerated features? The antlers of living and extinct deer, the horns of living and extinct types of rhinos, the fiddler crab's one large arm, the eye stalks of the stock-eyed fly, the frontmost appendages of the harlequin beetle, the horns of the Hercules and dung beetles, the mighty jaws of the warrior class of ants, the enormous heads of the warrior class of termites, all of these things exist either to maximize survivability in the interest of defense or to fight against your own species called intraspecific competition in order to obtain resources and mates. It's all in the interest of survival. Not to mention the adaptation of camouflage by both predator and prey, the adaptation of venom and poison by both predator and prey, the adaptation of flight independently evolved in birds, insects, reptiles, and mammals, plus a gazillion other things. Parasitism was something that Darwin specifically recoiled at. He noticed that some creatures are subject to such horrible misery by parasites that he couldn't possibly align this method of survival, which is massively beneficial to one species, but destroys the other, as the product of a benevolent force. It made much more sense to him in the light of brutal, ruthless survival in nature. I have to say, in case you guys didn't know, nature is a lot tougher than you think. Just think about how inconvenient it was the last time you went camping. Now imagine that being every day of your life, and you don't have a single piece of technology at your disposal. Many of the different stories and ideas centered around creation make the claim that nature was put in place to serve humanity. But this can't be right, because think of how much effort we have to go to in order to bend nature to our will. The amount of energy and man hours it takes to grow food, build and maintain shelter, create energy and heat is so vast that until the Industrial Revolution, almost everyone spent almost all of their time doing nothing but these things. We'll take a brief look at one other example of Darwin's ideas being confirmed with evidence. Darwin supposed that one species of organism can gradually become another species. Darwin predicted that we should find a fossilized organism that is an intermediate between theropod dinosaurs and birds, a missing link as it is oftentimes called. Just a few years after his prediction, Archaeopteryx was discovered. This was a bird, but not like any bird that had ever been seen. For one, it had teeth. It didn't just have teeth, it had a snout. There was no beak of any kind. Other bird fossils from more recent time periods show birds that do have beaks, but still have teeth. No species of bird today has teeth, except for some which have microscopic teeth during embryonic development, but then disappear before they hatch. Archaeopteryx also has a long, distinct tailbone, like all other theropod dinosaurs did. Modern birds have tiny tailbones, like us humans do. Archaeopteryx also has unfused fingers, with distinct claws. Modern birds almost all have finger bones that are fused at the tip, and no claws. Archaeopteryx also has the pelvic structure of a theropod. The three bones of the pelvis, the ilium, ischium, and pubis, are structured completely differently in theropods and Archaeopteryx than they are in modern birds. So was it even a bird? Yes, Archaeopteryx had feathers specifically for gliding. We don't know how well it could fly under its own power, but it was a bird. This goes back to the idea that there was no true first of any species. It doesn't look like what we think a bird is, but it's a bird. What I want to end with today is this. Make no mistake about it. Evolution and natural selection applies to you and me as well. We have thousands of hominid fossils, each showing gradual changes of the jaw and brain case, as well as the appendages and rib cage over millions of years, leading to modern day humans. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Next time, we're going to cover some other basic principles of natural selection, as well as debunk some common misconceptions about evolution. Thanks for watching.